couple of weeks ago, back at the anniversary of the game, I read you guys an article called The Movement of the World. The Movement of the World is one of the first things that the devs ever wrote setting up and establishing a setting for Guild Wars 2. They gave it to us, the players, early because, hey, it's just lore. It doesn't tell too much about the gameplay. They don't need any trailers and so forth. And then after that, it was released in a PC Gamer article. They went dark for years and years and years until eventually we got Guild Wars 2. What's fascinating about that article though is how some of the information on it absolutely translated into things we can see in the eventual game and how some of the other information is kind of totally weird and not in the game in any capacity and it's fascinating to think about how these parts of the movement of the world could have pushed the devs to make a different game than they did in the end. So today, as I promised in those videos back at the anniversary, I do want to talk about what some of those differences are. It's been a couple of weeks, but hopefully you guys remember it. There'll be a link on the screen if you want to check out the movement of the world itself just before getting into this. Some of this stuff is really fascinating. I want to pick out my most interesting parts and maybe you guys in the comments can talk about some of yours too. So we'll go in order from the start of the movement of the world down. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll start with the most interesting stuff. In fact, I think the most interesting stuff is right near the end when we hear about the Norn. But so the first thing really to see is a small comment about how the Battle Isles have been sank beneath the waves. This is really just a small thing for me, but uh, it is something that has always piqued my curiosity. Because of this comment here, only in the movement of the world, of which so much information could be undermined in other areas, there is a, a large amount of people in the lore-going community for Guild Wars 2 who will flat out refuse to believe that there is ever going to be anything in the Battle Isles ever again. For those of you that don't know, the Battle Isles was a small island chain set between Cantha, Elona and Tyria out in the middle of the unending ocean uh, where many Jinolai and Zaishan members of Cantha basically staked out and this is where all the PvP happened in the previous game. But the funny thing is here in the movement of the worlds they explain that when all rose or which actually if you look at a world map is really quite far away from the Battle Isles when all rose supposedly it drowned these out everyone on them died the structure presumably were washed away though the movement of the world doesn't explicitly say any of that but it says that they got flooded and disappeared and I can understand why the developers way back when would have written this I think they had ambitions to make Lion's Arch kind of the new uh, hub era for PvP and eventually they designed the idea of the Heart of the Mist for it instead uh, so there was no need for the Battle Isles especially considering they wanted it all a little bit more contained in the regular Tyrian regions but here's where things get a little bit interesting the Battle Isles would actually be a pretty cool place to set some stuff in Guild Wars 2, and no, I don't just mean in a random fractal that gives us a glimpse back to it. Uh, it would actually be a cool little stepping stone, say, on our way to Canther, and it would be interesting to see what happened with those people there. It also gives the devs an opportunity to discuss some lore that they haven't had a chance to for a long time, like the portals that Lord Audrund opened to the Mists. Uh, but then there's something even further. You guys will remember in Living World Season 2, there was an insanely awesome patch the devs released, whereby you got to travel to the Derman Priory Library. What an incredible patch that was probably my favourite living world patch they've ever done. Uh, even the, the season 3 stuff hasn't quite edged over, I think, in retrospect for this. What was so cool about this patch was an easter egg. The carpet in the floor of this library showed a world map of Tyria. And not just a world map of the continent Tyria, but the entire world. Showing Elona, showing Cantha, and oh, guess what? Also showing the Battle Isles. Which is interesting. Does that mean that this is an old map? And the Battle Isles are portrayed there because it was written a long time ago while they were still above the sea? Or do we maybe take it as contemporary because there are a lot of other features on the map that seem to suggest it is set in the current timeline? What's even more interesting about this map though is the inclusion of some shipping lanes and trading routes to not just Cantha, Tyria and Alona and the Battle Isles which we've seen but even to far-flung continents we've never gone to. That's right, there were developers just a couple of years ago writing new suggested lore that there might be shipping lanes between the Battle Isles and places we've never been. Wow, isn't that incredible? And so I would like to return there. It's just a small part in the movement of the world, but something I thought I'd like to say. All right, so let's move on. Let's uh, dig into some other things that aren't maybe so speculative. I really like this line. Uh, right at the start where they're describing the playable races of Guild Wars 2, they say this, they say that strange races, the Norn, the Asura, and the mysterious Silvari took over large portions of the continent. I like this line, not necessarily because it displays 
uh, things that never ended up in Guild Wars 2 itself, but because it really encapsulates that early feeling of getting to grips with a new franchise and its lore, right? That unfamiliarity with Tyria. You'd never hear ArenaNet describing the Norn or the Asura as strange races anymore, and you'd never hear anybody who classically plays the game on a reasonable amount of time to describe their ra those races as strange either. But back then, when this article was written, these were strange races to all of us because we didn't really know them and it was all fresh. And that kind Kind of excitement and adventure is something that I have since long lost and I always wrestle with every day to wonder you know is that bad writing that I've lost that or is it just because hey you're gonna get familiar with the product after long enough and you need to accept that uh, so the first really major deviation in my opinion comes when they're talking about the elder dragons the nature of the elder Gra dragons and specifically where they refer to Glint and Kunavang. So we talked about this actually a little bit on a recent Guild Wars 2 Mysteries. Uh, Glint and Kunavang were but youths, they say, only lesser powers to the ancients that came before. These mystic and terrifying creatures rival the gods themselves, and also there's a quite a little bit later in the movement of the world that says, Although these creatures are called dragons, referring to the elder dragons, they are as different from Kunavang and Glint as night to day. That second of the two quotes specifically are really interesting to me because it seems that what the devs were doing a long time ago in this article was trying to distance themselves from the idea that they'd done dragons before or that the dragons they'd already introduced to us actually meant anything. Glint and Kunavang weren't the only ones, by the way. Cantha was full of dragons. There were many salt spray dragons. And even there was a dragon to hatch in Alona uh, called, what was it, Shiny or something, another salt spray. And I think what the devs were trying to do is say, hey, we're going to have big badass dragons in Guild Wars 2 and try to forget about those old ones. Honestly, we've got something bigger and more badass now. They're not relevant. But it's funny then that really Glint has ended up very relevant. I specifically remember when the second novel came out, it blew my mind that Glint actually occurred within it and that Glint had such a big role to play and this connection to Krakatoric because the movement of the world had kind of suggested we weren't going to deal with the likes of Kunavang and Glint anymore. And the other weird outlier, I guess, when we're talking about stuff like this, is that they mention Kunavang in the movement of the world, as though now that Glint is so relevant, surely Kunavang will be very relevant? And yet, no Cantha so far means not a single... I don't even know if Kunavang, the word, has appeared ever in Guild Wars 2, except maybe that Derman Priory library where it appears in a book somewhere, because that library was just so awesome. Uh, moving on. There's another little quote talking about the Elder Dragons 2 that looks a little bit weird, a bit wonky by today's standards. They say that the Elder Dragons are born of older, different, and unfathomable magic. And I get what this is doing, right? It's trying to explain again, this is new, this is fresh, this is different, and they're like the old gods. But here's the thing, the recent patches have really started to dive into what magic is. And the idea that the Elder Dragons are channeling some other form, some unfathomable form of magic, is just absurd. Because, I mean, we've just had in a very recent patch, Timey explicitly saying, no, the magic they have is the same magic as all the rest. So that's kind of cool. Uh, there's also another funny quote. It's funny how much this recent patch has hit on the movement of the world stuff in a weird way. Uh, they talk about Primordus twisting earth and stone. There's always been a bit of an in-joke with this community when it comes to the dwarves because of this line here in the movement of the world. They establish to us that Primordus can do this, right? He makes his destroyers out of lava, out of magma, out of the earth itself, out of stone. He twists stone. And yet the devs had written this story where to fight Primordus, the dwarves had changed themselves into what? Stone? Really? D doesn't that mean they're weak to Primordus there? And it's funny, the most recent patch actually mentions this as well, uh, and they kind of sweep it under the rug. We meet a dwarf who says, oh, we turn to stone because stone is the only thing that fire can't damage. But come on, we all remember this arena net. It was a little bit weird making the dwarves turn to stone when their enemy manipulates it. Hmm. I wonder whether they'll just sort of slide that away, especially considering we're going to such Primordus heavy storylines here. Some more fun things as we continue along with the Elder Dragons, the Deep Sea Dragon. So listen, in the movement of the world, they probably give just as much writing time to Jormag and Krakatoric as they do to the Deep Sea Dragon. The Deep Sea Dragon, way back here, seems to be on par with the rest. Maybe mysterious, and certainly I think mystery and that idea of it being way out in the deep and there, there being that horror element was always a part of the Deep Sea Dragon. But I think at initial stages for Guild Wars 2, they, they were expecting themselves to do more with this character. Certainly not for it to be the most mysterious of them all, even superseding the mystery of Mordremoth and the true nature of the Silvari. 
No, the deep sea dragon here is kind of treated like the others. And they give us actually a reasonable amount of information which just didn't pan out in the game. Listen to this. They say that in the deepest waters of the sea, another dragon breathed. And they say that it twisted the waters themselves into tentacled horrors that rose from every lake and river of the land. Tentacled horrors from every lake and river of the land? The only tentacled horror we've ever seen in Guild Wars 2 is the Jade Moor from the Fractals. This has certainly not been something, and it's led to some odd questions in interviews with the devs too, because this article, The Movement of the World, is a real in-universe book. And so you can ask the devs things like, okay, how did a guy in-universe know about all these horrid flying tentacles and things when nobody seems to know about the existence of the deep sea dragon at all except very small groups so yeah that's funny how that all panned out on the topic of the uh fractals of the mists as well the idea that the jade moor could be related to the deep sea dragon i think is a really strong one and one of my biggest hopes honestly for if we ever go to canther or we get some of these deeper stories is that I hope we're in an expansion or a living world episode. We're going through the story, everything feels normal, and it's night time, we're doing our thing, and then slowly it dawns on you that you are playing the Jade Moor Fractal. That this is actually the real event that the Fractals have been replicating for all those years in the mists, and they've been kind of predicting the future or showing you a vision of the future, and it just sort of naturally unfolds into your experience while you're playing future storylines in Good Wars 2. I'd love that, as we actually finally go into Deep Sea Dragon territory. When that will happen, who knows? It's so mixed up with the idea of underwater combat and stuff, it still could be a little bit of a while. All right, another huge deviation coming up here. Balthazar helped to raise a new temple in Lion's Arch, stepping on the hearthstone of the construction and opening a gate there to the mist so that the heroes of each world could compete in contest. So this didn't happen at all. I, I, as far as I understand, there might be some weird slight hints. Funnily enough, for a long time in old Lion's Arch, and when I say old Lion's Arch, I mean original Guild Wars 2 launched Lion's Arch, not old Lion's Arch under the water. There were actually a couple of members of the Zaishan, I believe, hanging around, sort of near where Balthazar's portal may have been constructed, but they never ended up doing anything. I don't know how they explain this in-game, but this whole idea of there being a Balthazar temple into the mist, it was scrapped. This is obviously some kind of early precursor mention to the World vs. World systems, and we did, at launch, in the end, have portals to World vs. World, but they were surrogates, and there was none of this connection to the god in sight. Maybe they got rid of that because... It kind of conflicted with their ideas of the gods also receding a lot from the world, even if the timelines could have been made to match and fit. Interestingly enough as well, a while ago, if you guys are on my second channel, or third channel I suppose these days, Concrete Ducks, I did a video of Tyria 3D when they first get all the fancy new capabilities to show textures and things, and I showed off in Tyria 3D the very first trailer instance of Lion's Arch, and in that you could see the original idea they had for Balthazar's portal. It was developed at one point. It's like this spiral, spiraling staircase you could go up and the portal was above you in the sky. But at some point before the game came out, before even the alphas really, this idea was scrapped in favour of just having a bunch of Asura gates there instead. And all of the lore was thrown away. There was no portal from Balthazar. And it's not just here in the movement of the world they talk about. They talk about it a little bit later on too, uh, which we'll get to in a second. The next interesting little bit is where they're talking about... Uh, guilds, I guess. I just find this whole section wonky. Uh, they spend a long time saying why guilds are a prominent force in Tyria. It feels wonky to me because, really, there is guild influence in Guild Wars 2. But this uh, this section of the article seems to be suggesting that warbands are also guilds and crews are also guilds. And it honestly just seems like it's there because the name of the franchise is Guild Wars. And so, obviously, we're going to talk a bit about the guilds. Dragon's Watch and things more recently have been quite nice and have made Guild Wars feel like a more suitable name, but this is always going to be one of these funny things about this franchise, that Guild Wars just doesn't fit too much. Uh, in describing what the actual universe is about. Uh, ArenaNet have been really amazing at picking up old stuff lately. If there was another big guild mission update with new puzzles, new guild hall portal functionality and more, ah, oh, it'd be amazing and lines like this would seem less wonky. But okay, that, that's just me speculating about game features I want and it's probably a little bit off topic. Uh, next really cool quote. The gods of the humans have been notably distant these past two centuries, withdrawing into silence even as the world beneath them shattered. Although they still answer prayers, they do not intervene, even as Tyria crumbles and the human race calls out desperately for heroes to save them from their darkening struggle. 
Listen to the tone of that quote. If there's anything that strikes me overall about the movement of the world, it is the tone. It is very Guild Wars 1-ish, the tone here. The uncertainty between the alliances of the races and the ideas that humanity is in a darkening struggle, desperately crying out for heroes. Oof, this stuff really didn't end up in the game too well, did it? Uh, but what I really want to focus on, actually, is the importance of this line. This is the most explicit com comment we've ever really had as to the extent at which we really can communicate with the gods as humans in Guild Wars 2. There's nowhere in game, uh, through Heart of Thorns, through any of the Living World season, through the core, anywhere really that they properly touch on how much the, the gods are listening. There are people out there who will tell you, oh yeah, the gods are actually listening a lot. See, the movement of the world says they listen to prayers. And check it out, you've got the, uh, the racial skills, right? That's obviously the gods intervening a lot. But in so many other places of the story, the, the idea seems to be that they're just completely gone and silent and vanished entirely. I'd really like a story at some point to dive in on this and really talk a little bit more about, okay, how much of a response can you as a human expect to get out of the gods? Because it is clear the most explicit thing i think we've ever had aside from the racial skills which really isn't a good example is say the reaper of what it was the labyrinth that appears in the personal story right at the very end that's a pretty close communication but even then we're not communicating with with grenth we're communicating with some of his cronies so i find that that line there's a lot of weight on that line guys a lot for a big area of discussion uh moving on uh, I find it pretty curious, I won't give you guys a quote on this, but I find it curious, they're talking about humanity and Ebonhawk, I find it curious how much they set up Ebonhawk pre-launch. In articles like this, in the first two books, Ebonhawk was a huge, huge deal, and has a lot of great ideas in it, like the Fallen Angels, for example, only for it to have ended up in Guild Wars 2 as a place you do a couple of hearts and map completion. And I'm not saying there's not some quality to Ebonhawk. Ebonhawk does look pretty cool in Guild Wars 2. They did do pretty well making it look like a war fortress. And they did pretty well with the gates. And there's a lot of dialogue you can get there. But I mean, think about this, guys. No living world ever has taken place there. No even small events or anything's really taken place there. There's nothing. Despite all this pre-launch focus and having so much subject material, it honestly feels like if the devs ever found the space to make a new game, but set in the same IP. This is the perfect kind of little pocket place you could set your own another game, right? Like, what was happening in Evanhawk this entire time? And you could have all the intrigue and idea and problems and things that they suffer from there. I suppose the reason that Evanhawk hasn't had much to do is because they've also left the idea of the peace treaty between the humans and the Char super in Limbo too, and Evanhawk kind of suffers for that at the same time. Uh, I find it very interesting, still talking about humanity by the way, but moving over to Krita, I find it super interesting that the White Mantle in the original movement of the world were given equal screen time or, or space, equal footing with the centaurs when the developers were describing to us threats to Krita, okay? They say this, however, Krita is not unassailed. Secret agents of the White Mantle still fight for their unseen gods, plural. And the centaurs displaced across the continent are flooding into human territory, fighting over every scrap of land. That line is interesting to me. This is something that would have felt really out of place before 2016. The idea that there's just as much focus in Guild Wars 2 as the cent on the centaurs as there is to the White Mantle it would have been laughable before this year. It was all centaur all the time and basically no talk about the White Mantle at all except a tiny bit of personal story. But now, since 2016, since the raids, since the Living Worlds kicked up, happily, this line really seems to fit. It's kind of an example, I think, of how some of this stuff can look wonky, but as development continues, it stops looking so wonky. Uh, another interesting thing about the Fire Island chain, maybe this is just interesting to me right now because we're at the Fire Island chain in the current stories, but ships with black sails built from seized Corsair vessels sail along the Strait of Malkor west of Orr. These vessels surround the Fire Islands, manned by undead minions of the dragon that fear neither fo fire nor sea. That's interesting, right? These undead, the Risen, don't fear fire? That was something that they never really played with, and obviously now that the story's pushed on, we're not seeing these forces out in the waters around the Fire Island chain. Maybe the developers missed an opportunity with the Dwarf in Episode 2 of Season 3 to kind of say, hey, yeah, there used to be these black ships around and maybe he could have mentioned them. Now it kind of feels like this is something that will appear in the movement of the world, but will never appear in game again too. But hey, if we get another Fire Island chain map, maybe we'll, look, we'll, we'll see remnants of Zaitan's armies, even though a few years have passed. 
Okay, another big line. Big line. So much discussion. So much lore discussion and just franchise discussion is born of this line in the movement of the world. Get ready for it. This undead armada has cut off all human contact with Cantha, and the dragon's undead army wages war even now along the northern Elonian border, preventing all interior from departing to other lands for now. <laughs> wow, this line. I think this sets up very clearly that at the time ArenaNet were writing the movement of the world, they had pretty clear goals to start with Zaitan, kill him, and then to go to the other continents, just as they had done in Guild Wars 1, and then they'd expand further. I think that is so clear that that's what they were setting up. But then, instead, after we killed Zaitan, the company spent two years trying Living World, and other stories ended up taking precedence, and we've since not gone to those continents. That's not in the scope of the games, even to this day. And yet the only lore we've had explaining why we haven't got communication with Canther and Alona and stuff is still this one line from the movement of the world. That's it. And they haven't touched on it. It's uh, really crazy, actually, to see how much discussion comes out of this one line just because this is all the devs have had. Now they've kind of left it in limbo. Maybe they'll play with the story eventually. Canthons will communicate with us and they'll explain something else was holding them back. But uh, that's definitely a big floating point with a weird question mark that, again, feels kind of wonky. So they do a lot in the movement of the world that I'm just going to skip through here, uh, where they're talking about Cantha and Alona. They've set up a lot of great stuff for Cantha and Alona. This is some of still some of the most contemporary lore we have about Cantha and Alona. And because obviously they haven't released in game, there's not too much about it that feels wonky or weird, right? Because there hasn't been a chance for ArenaNet to either listen to it or not listen to it. So we'll ignore most of what they say there. There are some really cool things though, obviously. Stuff like the Mordant Crescent are so cool sounding. My jokes about Aureen recently, you know, how cute she is, insanely Disney anime cute. Those jokes come from a very real place in my heart that I want to see a monstrous high fantasy badass something going on in Guild Wars again. And do you know what? The Mordant Crescent may just be at the top of my list. They are just dark enough. Ah, oh, if they do them right, it could be really, really awesome. The other thing sort of vaguely related to Alona that they talk about is when they get to the Orders. They talk about the Order of Whispers. The Order of Whispers in the movement of the world is said to be maintaining its communication with Alona. And that never really has been shown properly in game now, has it? I kind of hate everything about Core Guild Wars 2's personal story and the fact that stuff like this was never touched on for four years despite the fact we're high ranking in this order is just another small part of my dislike for all that stuff. Uh, there's another discussion to have too, which is maybe the Order of Whispers transformation from being a manipulative order of demon hunters, okay, hunters, uh, to pure stealth and just, oh, we're sneaky and hiding, is uh, is another discussion, but maybe that's not to do with the movement of the world itself. Let's move on. Okay, so another cool line, back to the Battle Isles. With the fall of the Battle Isles, Lion's Arch became the guild home, they say, a central point for the guilds of the world, as well as the conduit to the Heroes Hall. So we already talked about the Battle Isles stuff, but there's more interesting things here. I love that since Heart of Thorns and the introduction of the big guild base and stuff, in Lion's Arch, that's that comment in there, Lion's Arch became the guild home, is actually really true these days. It's another example of something that was wonky and now isn't. Uh, but this other stuff, the, Lion's Arch is the conduit to the Heroes Hall. This is obviously referencing the idea that Balthazard made a portal there, which didn't happen in the end. But what this is actually suggesting is I think the devs thought Heroes Ascent, the classic ad hoc tournament progression style PvP game type, which was my favourite PvP Guild Wars as a franchise has ever delivered, by the way. It su suggests that they actually wanted that in Guild Wars 2 and it was going to be there in Lion's Arch but as we all know now there is no portal to the Hall of Heroes. Hall of Heroes is barely ever talked about in Guild Wars 2. We can go to the Mists, specifically Fractals, specifically the World vs. World stuff and the Heart of the Mists but there is no Hall of Heroes despite the fact that the, uh, the movement of the world talks about it. Okay, uh, and so we'll wrap up the video, guys, with some of the last stuff that the Movement of the World talks about. It talks about some of the other contemporary races. They spent ages talking about humans, because obviously humanity had a ton of lore based on all the campaigns from Guild Wars 1. 
But uh, I, I find this quite curious, actually, in that they came really close with a lot of the descriptions in the movement of the world here. Like the char, right? You read what they say about the char and the movement of the world, and you know what? It's pretty much bang on to what we got in Guild Wars 2. They followed that really closely. Aside from terms like the Gold Legion instead of Flame Legion, and then we get a lot more Flame Legion in, in Guild Wars 2, uh, basically everything's the same. They never did the fallout of the Flame Legion after the personal story too well, but the core lore of the char that they'd been writing translated incredibly well. Uh, the Asura too, uh, I think they get very well, though there is one standout line here, listen to this, uh, they say, in fact, when describing the Asura, one might even call them condescending, as they are perhaps a touch too confident for the comfort of some other races. This is kind of funny, looking back, a touch... A touch too confident. Yeah, all right then. Okay, they definitely didn't get flanderized. Uh, moving on, they do have another quote about the Asura, which I love so much, though it's not particularly well shown. They say this, Although some say the Asura have integrated into society, it would be more accurate to say they're creeping over it like ivy and moss, fingers digging into crevices where their magic can take hold. This is definitely more Guild Wars 1 in tone, the idea of them being incredibly manipulative, and this was one of the big things I used to love thinking about with the Asura before the game came out. And again, wasn't touched too well, but it's still a favourite of mine with a description for the Asura. And now though, though the Char, the Silvari were done incredibly well, the Asura were done incredibly well, we come to the Norn, and the Norn kind of blows my mind, the descriptions we get here in the movement of the world, and maybe it's because this stuff wasn't touched on that the Norn feel sort of shallow to me with what we eventually got. The Norn appear really nuanced, not just boisterous, loud, simple characters, which I feel we kind of get them as in Guild Wars 2. These guys, really, there was a lot of political and alliance-based stuff going on. So I won't read all of that out to you. Hopefully you guys listened to the movement of the world recently, so you know what they're talking about. But basically, they suggest that there's a game of neutrality to be played, that the Asura are trying to keep nice and neutral, but there's a lot of tension between the other races, like a lot. The Char and humans obviously had still had a lot of tension. This is at a point where they'd really only still been describing the two races at war, but things get insane with the Norn, okay? They write story here about the Norn not particularly liking the humans, or the Char. I think this was likely written before ArenaNet came to their core ideals of everyone in this MMO being friendly to everyone, each other all the time, and it left them a lot of space to play with where the Norm would sit in the grand scheme of things. They suggest that they have these raiding fights against the Char, that there had been flat out battles between the two peoples, and that there's no formal peace between them, but they both sort of respect each other and allow passage, that the Norn knowingly allowed the Char through their lands in Guild Wars 1 to attack the humans and then there's the relationship between the Norn and the humans which is even better okay listen to this quote the Norn have also kept ties with their human friends although those ties are not as close as they once were for the Norn often felt betrayed by their unpredictable human allies in recent years that sense of betrayal has deepened as the Norn do not trust the Crichton Queen none of this is anywhere near Guild Wars 2 in any capacity as far as not even like a vague small comment from an NPC in Holbrack alludes to this untrusting situation. Uh, we, we do obviously have some ideas of the Queen maybe being difficult to trust and stuff on those Ariel stories, but the Norn factoring into that as a united peoples? No, we don't get that. And I really like to think about how the Norn could have shone in that story in that kind of alternate version of Guild Wars 2 that might have ended up being developed. So there you go guys, that's uh, that's the movement of the world, those are my thoughts really, that the standout areas where the movement of the world just feels so different and fascinating to read. I do love the article and I hope you guys don't take this video badly and that this is me criticising Guild Wars 2. I think a lot of this stuff, they had very good reason to not follow in the end, absolutely. But it does definitely make you think about what the community was expecting of the game way back when. And yeah, maybe an alternate universe where they had actually thrown some of this stuff in. But maybe some of the other things hadn't been thrown in. So there you go guys, that's the movement of the world, that's the discussion, I promised it to you. Here's the video, thanks very much for watching, hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you think, what your standouts were. And until next time, I guess I will see you very soon. If you do want to watch the movement of the world, there'll be a link to it on screen in about two seconds. So stick about. I'll catch you next time.
to a brand spanking new sequel. In it, we were told there would be a 250 year time jump. 